Radio Rock presents an interview with Ian Gillen, Deep Purple, presenting the new album Turning to Crime, an interview made by you rock. This is Radio Rock Italy, and with us we have the pleasure having the great Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? Bertone, my friend. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I am fine. I'm fine. Ian Gillen is here to talk about a new Deep Purple album that will be released on November 26th, that is this week. The album is called Turning to Crime. It is a different kind of album, very unexpected. An album made of wonderful cover version of a very special set of songs. There are songs from Bob Dylan, Ray Charles, Fleetwood Mac, and ladies and gentlemen, even Led Zeppelin in an instrumental medley. So Ian, quoting a line from a former American president, there you go again. We have another Deep Purple album. Please, tell us all about it. Yeah, I think we've all been through the same experience over the last couple of years. Yes. Suddenly finding ourselves in a different place and so we couldn't make any records because if we write music we have to be in the same room together and then of course the producer came up with an idea well why don't you record it remotely well that's okay we can do that i mean everybody does that <clears throat> but where do the songs come from because we can't write unless we're in the same room so that's when we came along the idea of uh, doing the covers and uh So we did record it remotely, uh, but we made it sound as if it was in the same room. And um, it was um, a difficult decision for a few days at the beginning. I wasn't convinced because covers is a dirty word. And um, so I thought that not only myself, but you know, some of the more purist fans and some of the more severe critics would think it might be a crime for Deep Purple to record covers as an album I mean we've recorded loads of covers over the years but uh, we've never done a whole album together but circumstances kind of pushed us in this direction and once we got going it was fantastic um, the process was fairly simple we all threw in a load of ideas um, for a long list and um, I'm very glad to say that not one of my selections was recorded in the end <laughs> so that relieves me of any responsibility of having to explain my, my selections anyway it went very quickly and when I first heard the first backing track with just bass and drums I thought my god the energy in here is incredible so um, it looked like a fun project and that's how it turned out I had a um, I had a conversation with uh, somebody last year who asked me what, what you're doing during the lockdown. And I said, I've been turning to crime. And we, we had a laugh and uh, he said, what kind of crime? I said, no, I can't tell you most of the stuff, otherwise the police will be knocking on my door. But um, most of it is thought crime anyway, so don't you worry about that. Anyway, it hung over that this might be a criminal act, so we thought of turning to crime as being a good title. And then I had a photograph taken by the seaside Um, down in England on a windy day and uh, I looked like an escaped convict <laughs> so um, we, we, we showed the photographs to the office and they all thought, oh yeah we do that with everyone they'll look like uh, mug sharks you know so that's how it all came together and um, it, in, as always we had a ball doing it and um, I think everyone's not only surprised but delighted at the way it turned out I had the privilege of listening to the record and could not believe you made it recording remotely. There is a song, for example, called Let the Good Times Roll, where it seems you guys are performing live in a jazz club in New Orleans, such as the feel, the connection, the dynamics in the performance of the song. How can you achieve this kind of magic, even recording far away from each other? I mean, it's fairly obvious that you can't just sit down and play like a session man if you want to purpleize all these songs. So we, we just play as we would normally play in a jam, and somebody takes the lead. I mean, I think Bob Ezrin allocated a few songs to each separate uh, instrument player, and they created their own backing track, and the others added on to it. But the, and the um, solo ideas, as you can hear, are sort of, as usual, very 
um, cleverly constructed. But uh, it, it's all a question of somebody does one bit and then somebody picks up on another. And they have time to, more than normally, we do this on stage, this improvisation, and it happens instantly. But this time, I think they had a chance to listen to it and perhaps it's a little more constructed. The musical, but for me, the instrumentation on this record is is the epitome of Deep Purple. It's um, it's the human chemistry in a band that's been it's together incredible. for so long. It will, it should sound. There is a song in the album that I absolutely loved. Very unexpected song, and it's called "The Battle of New Orleans." But you know, uh, it is interesting, and it's got a great connection with us. Um, in many ways. First of all, <clears throat> back in the days of Skiffle in England, which came just before rock and roll, there was a guy called Lonnie Donegan who was um, the king of Skiffle, as we used to call him. And he used to record songs in his early days, not the rubbish novelty songs he did later, like My Old Man's a Dustman and Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight. They were comedy songs later on, but mm -hmm. he brought across for Skiffle, a lot of what we call bluegrass music, and there were songs like Cumberland Gap, Gambling Man, and The Battle of New Orleans. We used to perform that in episode six. Roger Glover used to sing it, and um, I used to do backing vocals with the others. When this came up, the suggestion, I was all for it, and um, <laughs> so was Roger, obviously. Roger is singing the first verse, if I have heard correctly. Well, he sings all the way through, but I mean, he sings the first verse and then we all join, I join yeah. in with him and it becomes more of a group thing. But um, then Steve Morse wanted to know why you English guys could possibly sing a song about getting beaten by the Americans in the back <laughs> of New Orleans. He said, I wouldn't do that if we've been beaten by you. I said, Steve, you have to understand a few things. Number one, it's the English, um, in the English character, we have to laugh at ourselves first before we laugh at other people. That's, yeah. that's in the rule book. <clears throat> Secondly, we're not stupid, although we might look like it sometimes, but we, in those days, we used to march in a straight line wearing bright red jackets, carrying our rifles over our shoulders, with guys blowing bugles, waving flags, beating drums, letting everyone know well, here we are, while you guys hid behind cotton bales, picking us off with your squirrel guns. So it was something we, we don't do that anymore. We don't want march in a straight line and wear red jackets. It, it, it's stupid. So um, we had a laugh about that. And um, as I say, it's an historical song. And um, I, I, I think it's important in the history of the evolution of rock music in England particularly that um, a skiffle song should be included it's it's very much came just before um, you know our awareness of Chuck Berry and um, Little Richard and Pat Domino and yeah, people like that so um, <laughs> that's when nobody had any instruments to be in a skiffle band you had to make your own instruments that was the rule <laughs> uh, I, I used to I used to play bass made from a tea chest and a broomstick and a washing line. And I played drums made from biscuit tins and knitting needles. Wow. And we had other instruments like washboards and comb and paper. You put a comb and a piece of tissue paper up against the comb and you can make it sound like a kazoo because you get a buzz through it. And anything else that came to hand, you know, pots and pans. And that was the instrumentation for Skiffle. It was an important just uh, only lasted a, a year or so, but it was very important. And Ian, for you as a singer, it must have been quite a task to perform songs that you did not write. Uh, was it a big challenge for you to do that? <laughs> well, well, it's interesting you say that because I can't, I, I mean, sometimes I, write, I sing songs that I did write and I can't even remember that I wrote them. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I've always done that. That's how I learned to sing, by singing other people's songs, trying to learn about their range, their technique, their, their sound, the sound of the percussive values, the vowel sure. sounds, the tone, and the dynamics and texture of singing. It's, it's all a big education for me for the first, well, 20 years, I think. It took a long time to find my own voice completely. 
So I'm very happy singing other people's songs, particularly as I arrive at the studio without a headache, because I haven't had to write the damn thing. <laughs> In 2022, Deep Purple will be back on the road with the Woosh Tour, finally. You have released two new albums since the last time you were on the road. What can we expect from this new upcoming tour? Yeah, I suppose we will have to make this decision when we reach the bar on the night before the show, first show, I suppose, or possibly even when we get to the sound check. Um, <laughs> but I would, I imagine... We'll be doing a couple of songs from Wush and a couple of songs from TTC. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it might be three or four, or it might be just one or two, I don't know. Um, we'll have to see how they work out live. I, I, could, I can certainly think that I could put forward a couple. I'd love to do seven and seven years and, and, um, and one or two others in, in, in the show. That would be great. And from Wush, there's a, you know, there's two or three there that I think we just fit right in. So we'll have to give it consideration, but of course it's a long way ahead, so I, I can't say now. Deep Purple will finish the tour in Lisbon, uh, November 6, 2022, at the Campo Pequeno. And Radio Rock will be media partner of this concert. You, Ian, have a special bond with Portugal. You spend a lot of time there. Tell us a little bit about your love story with Portugal. How did it start? And why is it such a special place for you? Well, I have a few places in my heart that I call my spiritual homes. <laughs> <coughs> and that all started with Beirut and with Lebanon back in the 60s. And I would since include then Japan, Poland, Italy, um, um, Brazil for sure, and uh, Portugal. Um, these are very close to me. And I... You know, between the tours, going all my life really, you, t you take a break. <coughs> it's um, it's a strange situation if you're a, a traveling musician, because you go away for a long tour and you don't see your family, and when you get home you want to put your feet up and watch some sport on TV, and your family's all got their suitcases packed and say, right, let's go on holiday. <laughs> so I've just come back from being on the road, and so, of course... I have to go on holiday because it's a wonderful time to share with your family. But it means you're never really home and you're constantly traveling. So we had some fantastic times when we were younger in the Caribbean. I used to go there regularly two or three times a year between tours. And, you know, my wife and daughter used to fly out and we used to go scuba diving and have a great time. Um, then, of course, we were thinking of buying a place there, but... <coughs> It's um, a long way for relatives and friends to go for a, for a weekend. So we started looking at Spain, the Bilirac Islands, and Ibiza and Menorca. And um, then we came to Portugal one year. A friend of mine lent me a house here. And then I started renting, and I fell in love with the place. It's very similar to home. We, Portuguese have a very similar sense of humor. Um, they like to laugh a lot. Oh, and um, the beer is really good. Um, <laughs> the bread is the bread is really good. I can buy a loaf of bread for 70, 80 cents. I can get a beer for eighty cents. And in England, the beer, is, you know, I mean, it's silly price five pounds, so it's worth six euros for a beer. You know, it's it's it, it's a no, it's a, it's a no brainer. Yeah. And cool. of course, then there's the weather, and the weather's pretty good too. So, it, long story short, about um, 15 years ago, I stopped renting and I bought a house here. So, I spent half my free time in Portugal and half my free time at my home, family home in England. Any songs or lyrics inspired by Portugal? I write all the time, so wherever I am. Um, but I, I do a lot of work here. I finished two projects also, apart from the music. I finished two other projects during this... Um, Wow. Period. And um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's great. If, if you, I've, it's a working atmosphere in this house, so in this casa. So um, I'm, 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 I'm very inspired by the atmosphere here. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm inspired by the atmosphere. I haven't written anything specifically about Portugal, but I've had some fantastic, for example, I've had fantastic photographs taken down here. By an American 
American guy called Bob Mussel who um, spent three days here taking photographs on the Algarvian beaches, in the little back streets of um, our villages and in, um, some rural shots. But, you know, it, there's such a range of things and the light is so good. Um, it's, so it, it all ties in. So I haven't written anything specifically about Portugal, no, but I haven't written anything specifically about many places, apart sure, from sure. Japan, possibly. Well, this was the last question of the interview. So thank you, Ian, for being with us and for always being generous with Radio Rock and its listeners. We really appreciate it. Well, so. you've always been good to me. It's a great pleasure, mate. Well, thank you for your kind words and see you next time. I'll see you. <laughs> I'll see you in Lisbon next year. Of course, of course. <laughs> of course. With your, with your fantastic band. Oh, thank you, thank you. Either you're very generous. Be careful, you could get arrested for sure for this, you know, not for the album, but for yeah, such well, a statement. Yeah. For such a... You know, I'm, I'm, living a, <laughs> I'm living a criminal life these days. <laughs> well, okay, thank you so much, Ian, and uh, Turning to Crime will be released on November the 26th. It's a fantastic album again. Buy it listen to it because it's really a joy this interview was presented by Radio Rock and was made by You Rock <laughs>